2020 Supplier Webinar, the third in the series. My name is Janneke. I'm the Managing Director of ITS Canada. Today, we are being joined by three members, Novax Industries, Ameson and Stinson ITS, who will share their new initiatives, products or services to aid the industry in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Each company will be given 10 minutes, followed by a five minute Q&A. And you can leave your question, if you have any, in the question pane. And after each presentation, I will share your questions with the respective presenter. I wanted to start off today with a poem. It's called When This Is Over by Laura Kelly Panucci. When this is over, may we never take again for granted a handtake with a stranger, full shelves at the store, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, Friday night out, the taste of communion, the routine checkup, the school bus each morning, coffee with a friend, the stadium roaring, each deep breath, a boring Tuesday, life itself. When this ends, may we find that we have become more like the people we wanted to be, we were called to be, we hoped to be, and may we stay that way better for each other. And I was wondering if Doug has joined the call. Uh, Doug, Tony, if you can unmute yourself. Okay, so Doug is not uh, joined the call yet. So I am moving on um, to Matthew. Matthew Jukes is the president of Ameson Inc. Matthew has over 20 years of professional experience in intelligent transportation systems and transportation modeling and planning. His areas of expertise include business development, project management, and modeling, including integrated corridor management, ITS modeling, logical microscopic and mesoscopic models, data analysis, optimization of transportation databases, and corridor need studies. Through his years of involvement on the San Diego ICMS project, Matthew has published several papers and presented at the TRB annual meeting, ITS Canada, ITLS World Congress, and USDOT ICM workshops. And Matthew, I am going to make you the presenter. Okay. Excellent. Can you hear me, Yannicka? Yes, I can. OK, so right now everybody should be seeing an island. And I will start my presentation. OK, and I can see that it seems everybody's seeing it. Um, very quick background on who we are, if you don't know us already. Um, we're Ameson, a, a worldwide company, um, also a C, um, owned by Siemens. Um, and we develop modeling software, but we're more than just modelers. We're a modeling software. We're a group of modelers, um, developers, data analysts. Um, and in putting this together, I got some help from uh, a couple of our key people in our company and one of our data, um, <clears throat> data scientists. So really, how has things changed? So before even getting into what we're doing, we've, we've done some analysis because we have access to a lot of data sources and real-time data sources because of our uh, online system where we do live real-time predictions using modeling. So we decided to collect some of the data from some of these systems, and in particular, the San Diego area, and look at how things have changed. Because ever since this happened in, in early March, traffic got a lot lighter. Um, the amount of people using transit right now is very limited. It's, it's really limited now to the people who have no other choice and must travel. Um, for the most part, we're, you're not seeing people who have an option of taking a car going on transit. Um, there's, there's a fear side to everything about that. Um, <clears throat> finally, uh, up until this happened, 
rideshare had been growing and growing. The use of Uber, Lyft, um, shared vehicles, it, it was seeing a very big uptake, but, but we wonder what's gonna change with that with this? How, how comfortable will people be with taxis and Ubers and, and Uber pool type vehicles um, going forward? And I think we'll see a shift in their business model as they focus on autonomous vehicles or greater security for their drivers and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and finally, the interesting part is to really sort of dive into how all of this is impacting the traffic. And, and so what we did was we, we created a couple of graphs where we looked at all of the data sensors within the um, San Diego area and corresponded with the number of cases and the number of deaths being reported um, with the US, California, and San Diego um, to sort of show that as you, as you see this drop in traffic, drop, uh, rise in the number of cases, you see a significant drop in traffic until it sort of plateaus to a point where you now have the required number of people who still have to, you know, those, the, all of those hard workers who are having to go to work and service, the, whether it's the food industry or the medical industry, health industry, and get out there, you still have it. But we saw significantly almost a 50% drop in traffic with the cases. And similarly, the deaths was a little, ha started happening a little bit later, but it's that same trend um, as we're going on. One interesting thing, I don't have the graph, it's not as telling, I was very curious to see was whether or not we would see a drop in um, traffic initially and slowly see a rise in it. And what I found was the first week of April was actually the most, the lowest one, but it also corresponded with Easter. But really since then, it's been plateaued and it may be different for the last week, but up until last week, it had sort of plateaued. And it was interesting how Monday was always the lightest day. And then Friday, for some reason, had about 5% more traffic. And I think it's by the end of the week, everybody wants to go get their shopping done or do that initial trip that they have to do once a week. So <clears throat> one of the things we then did is we took all of this data and we have our, our systems that allow us to put it into our artificial intelligence and our data analytics to try and understand how things changed and what things are, um, what trends are happening and, and such. So what you see on the right is a graphic of all the different day types patterns that we found, the cluster analysis of data over time. And we reran our tools, which help clean the data and, and put it into the right clusters. And the interesting part we found was we found two new patterns show up with, with the new data added when we extended the data set out till April. And what you see there is in the two bottom graphs, the green one and the red one correspond with pattern six and pattern nine. And what those correspond to are the weekday and weekend patterns for the after the COVID um, event. The interesting part about that is, although we saw a 50% drop, you still see during the weekday, and I was I was definitely taken aback a little bit by this because I thought we'd see a much more level graph. You still see an AM peak between five and nine AM and a PM peak from two to about, <coughs> excuse me, 6 PM. And the peaks may not be quite as big as they were before or as long, but that same trend is there. And then once again, with the weekend one, you sort of see that the grass sort of gradually grows to the middle of the day. And then as you hit three o'clock, it starts to go down, but it's that same trend as we see in the blue one above it of a weekend, a normal weekend. But once again, with a significant drop in the amount of traffic that we're seeing. So one of the things is we have these tools that um, especially where we've deployed our systems in San Diego, Florida, we're working on a pilot in the Toronto area right now. Um, that allow us to collect lots of data, do the ana 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 analysis of it, and also start creating the analytical predictions and develop new traffic trends and patterns. One of the interesting things with this is these systems are able to see um, how that demand, how the use of the network is changing over time and capture it and using the AI are out able to dynamically adjust their demands moving forward. 
obviously there are certain things with the model that will then need, we're talking about a, a drastic change in travel patterns that will need some maintenance and some manual steps, but we really will get to it with time. One of the things also we, we felt as a company is a lot of, um, it's changed the way people do business. Everybody now works from home um, for the time being. And so we, we've done a few initiatives. We've released our free viewer. Um, we just, you just need to fill out a form to let us know who you are. Um, and it allows you to view any models that anybody's done sort of thing if, you have, if you're a client and such. But we've also, normally we would charge a fee for remote, remotely using the software. During this time, we've removed those fees and let everybody know that if they need to access the software remotely, we'll provide them with a remote license so that they can do it from their home without having to have the physical uh, software license dongle with them. So there's a number of things we're trying to do to help this industry and help facilitate just how um, the traffic trends are changing and, and how our working ways are changing. Um, we definitely see that um, as we move forward, we're gonna see a change in just that whole way of things work, we've gone work. Um, I, for one, have been somebody who, up until March, I have been on a plane almost weekly, um, just visiting with clients and sort of getting messages out there and stuff. And my family doesn't know what to do with me. Um, it, it's quite funny to, to see them wonder why I'm still sitting in the house and not at the airport or something. But it'll be interesting to see. We will go back to a normal, but will we ever go back to what we were before? Um, so we need a robust system that allows us to test multiple scenarios. And modeling is a great, great system for this because all of the historical models are going to need to be redefined. We used to build models and then base them off of that model look 20 years out. Well, now you've got this change where 20 years out is no longer what 20 years out looks like and five years out doesn't look the same before. Um, we need to be able to test how the changes in <clears throat> transit use, the changes in ride sharing services, how, how after this, more people now know they can work from home and how it works. Um, and will we see more people driving their own cars to work? Will there be an increased need for traffic? And being able to have models that will allow us to test out these scenarios. Um, we don't know the answers, but we need to have a quick way of being able to come up with some of the recommendations needed to solve these problems. And finally, it's not, oh, sorry, I'm one ahead of myself. For these models, we um, really need future, future proof models with more robust data services. So we need to start no longer thinking about the typical day, but how, how changes are gonna happen over time, um, how we're gonna get these data. So we normally rely very heavily on counts, but we're gonna need to now incorporate the origin and destination trips, the travel times and things like that in that which will require connected vehicles and cellular type um, data services to be incorporated with also this historical traffic loops and traffic counts. Um, because we really need to aim for a dynamic integration of data with these modeling tools to make them as robust as they possibly can. And now finally, the, the other thing is, it's not just about um, cars. It's also gonna be about how we interact as people on while we're walking around the streets and such. Um, Ameson, uh, with our latest release, Ameson Next Pedestrian Simulator um, is being included as part of the um, tools. And it's really gonna help us to be able to model those areas of heavy flow and bottlenecks on the sidewalks and in, around the streets. Um, testing management strategies such as channelized directional flow. What if you made one side of the road one direction and one side of the other road another direction on the sidewalks? How would that impact people? And just dealing with the interaction on sidewalks and crosswalks and, and those bottlenecks that pedestrians um, often face. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to thank you. I'd also like to thank Farron Torrent, who's the data scientist who did a lot of our initial research. Um, I think we may be having a white paper coming out soon. And as always, feel free to contact us or just go visit our website. Thank you, Yannicka.
Thank you, uh, Matt. So there is one uh, comment received in a question box um, from Paul, and Paul says, uh, Paul Hutton, very impressive to, ha to have done this analysis while being able to deliver the remote working tools for clients at the same time, which must have been a lot of work. I don't know if you want to comment, uh, uh, Matt. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I would say on the data analysis side, we're, we were really well positioned. We have access to all of the data. Um, we have to do this analysis norm with normal data for building our systems. So it was just it was just a natural progression. And we do have some really, really intelligent data scientists. My analysis was nothing like Ferenc, Ferenc, and and really it, it it's really an interesting side of things. And we're just glad to be able to provide um, to our customers things that help them to be able to continue to work. Thank you. Um, question from uh, Neil Kochar. Um, the applicability of these tools analyzing traffic patterns and impact of changes on e-commerce deliveries like Amazon, Courier Express parcel industry, and freight flows like truck long haul and short haul. Let's go ahead. So, so it's a vehicle based model where we have vehicle types and we do have freight models in there and such. Um, and you can also combine them with the macroscopic planning tools that do those freight studies and freight, uh, freight demand studies. And it really allows you to then play with things. Things are going to change dynamically that you can change the, the frequency or the routing of the trucks through the cities and the number of trucks because Amazon suddenly has their minivans instead of tractor trailers and things like that. But I think the applicability for these tools is a lot of a lot of cities already have models built. And now if you leverage the tools that let you have the flexibility with those models, you can do endless number of tests. And it's it's quick to with the cloud nowadays, we'll we'll throw up a hundred different scenarios, simulations up into the cloud. And the next day you can do the data analysis um, and look at it on a GIS and see how each different change in a parameter or a factor can really have an impact on the network or not. Um, and it really is partially about that of having that flexibility because we have to test so many different scenarios now to be able to have the right answers when that scenario comes true. Thank you. And Paolo? Uh, asks, is the pedestrian engine still based on Legion? No. <laughs> Thank you, Paolo. No, this is our own engine. Um, the, we had a eight, we had a add-on for Legion within it, which had some limitations and stuff. But no, we have now um, developed our own um, pedestrian simulator that comes as part of the Ames and Next package. So it is actually separated from the Legion simulator. I probably didn't do justice to, for Paolo's question, but hopefully that works. But if you want more information on the pedestrian simulation, um, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll gladly give a demo of it. Um, Thank you. Or Thank you. Um, there's no other questions. So I am going to, and thank you, Matt, by the way, for uh, for your presentation. And I was gonna ask um, whether, what is a positive um, for you that is, is uh, through COVID-19, but I guess it's that your family uh, has their dad home, um, and that's a good thing, I guess. Um, yeah, so I'm going to uh, yeah, take. Say, and we're huh? also all continuing. We're also all continuing to find a way to keep moving forward. Yeah. So thank you. Um, Duck has arrived. Duck Gooby is the director, vice president, and chief technology officer of Novax Industries, and a past director for ITS Canada. Douglas has been instrumental in the research and development of ITS-related technologies at Novax, from concept through to design. Doug Douglas has been a key player in the area of intelligent pedestrian systems, pedestrian vehicle detection, and transit signal priority systems and research, working on new technologies and techniques to enable pedestrians and transit to move faster, more efficient and safer. ITS plays a big role in Douglas's interest at Novax in his goals of providing solutions that are scalable, work with existing standards and integrate with current and future technologies. Douglas's research and involvement in the transportation industry 
exploring new ways to improve the movement of people and transit has led to new standards that are currently in use today. Doug graduated with the Diploma of Technology in Electronics at British Columbia's Institute of Technology, holds a Certificate of Training, the National Architecture of the U.S. Department of Transportation, and Toastmasters in Surrey. Doug, I am going to make you the presenter. All right, thank you very much, Yannick. I much appreciated. You're welcome. Um, I also, uh, I have, um, I'm just trying to see which screen I'm actually presenting, just to want, bear with me for one moment. Um, monitor two. Okay, um, just want to make sure as my presentation is uh, coming up on the front there, you can see the title screen. Yep. It says okay, COVID, COVID 19 pandemic and impact on delivering urban livability and mobility. Okay, that's the one. All right, very good. Well, thank you, thank you very much, um, Yannicka, for the uh, for the opportunity. Um, I've also got Mr. David Atnikoff with me, actually, um, to uh, as a co-presenter with uh, for, with Novax. He's the CEO of, of Novax. I've been here for a long time and has uh, uh, a lot of experience with ITS and being a uh, on the board of ITS Canada for a number of a number of seasons. We call it and uh, very invested in his time personally and with the business in uh, in ITS initiatives too, uh, also. So, anyway, David. So, um, just wanted to welcome everybody, and I wanted to kick this off with the the really I think the message that Yannick has sent at the very beginning, and this is about relationships. This is the most critical thing we are going to be doing over the next two months, two years. 20 years is ensuring that trying to be focused on our relationships with our customers, with our suppliers, with our friends of the firm, with everybody who can provide input and, and some kind of perspective, at least on their particular concerns. Because what we're finding is, I think Matthew pointed out so well, is we're not dealing with historical uh, modeling anymore. The world is moving into a new place. The models that we had are going to have to be reviewed at a minimum and probably rejigged completely uh, when we start considering people not traveling in, in, in public transit as much as they were. And I think Doug gets onto that subject matter. But as far as as far as us continuing on as a society, as a business community, as ITS, I can't thank uh, ITS Canada enough for being at the forefront and trying to push networking and people continuing to talk to each other because i think the first the first reaction we have is to become almost isolationist and that's what's happened we've all moved into our houses and we're doing zoom meetings but we're not getting out and talking to each other as much so um bravo and thank you yannick i'm giving you a quick applaud thank and you I appreciate it. and i want to put this on now to uh to Doug, he's got some ideas and some uh, some uh, subject matter which we hold dear to our heart. And I think one of the reasons that Novax was asked to talk is because, unlike some of the technologies that we in the in the real world, ours is truly a, a human to infrastructure uh, physical interaction. Whereas you can see on this picture, I've driven to work in the last two days. I've seen twice driving to work people doing exactly what this young woman's doing on the screen there, using her elbow to press the button. So what does that tell us about where we might be going? Doug? Well, thank you very much, David. Yes, and, and yeah, thank you, Yannicka. This has been, a, uh, I know, a monumental effort, you know, putting these things together and keeping things float that way, so, uh, and getting people connected. So, anyway, without further ado, I will continue on. Um, and, you know, taking a look at, at that stock at where we're at kind of thing, it's kind of wondering what the new norm is. I mean, the, the crystal ball is probably a pretty hazy promotion. We're kind of looking out and seeing what other countries are doing, other people are doing, um, you know, what's happening, what is the future going to look like? And it's interesting, in, in the space of a year, we've actually just gone from, you know, the critical issues back in the last ITS Canada and Halifax talking about how can ITS adapt to climate change? Now we're talking about how can ITS adapt to a pandemic? You know that quickly um and so that you know the band is pretty high just understanding from its perspective you know how can we how can its or companies involved in its uh, evolve in this area and uh, and help improve things or help maybe return uh, return to a new normal whatever that normal looks like 
uh, and, and really sort of taking a look at is it means the, the impact on transportation and mobility, uh, as Mike is, uh, Matt is talking about. Um, so, so uh, taking a look at about breaking out mobility, for, for example, in, in, uh, in traffic, um, we're talking about you know a lot of the, uh, the the government measures that are in place currently. Talking about the pandemic, shelter in place measures that are in place. You know, people are working from their homes, for instance, instead of working at their office, and people are getting quite comfortable doing so. And so, you know, how that might evolve in the future? Maybe we don't have a big office space anymore. Long any longer, we have either smaller or no office space. Um, I guess people have kind of come up with a new way of, of communicating. And so what does that impact in terms of people and transportation? Um, in terms of short, medium, long-term pedestrians, transit, and bicycles. And then I was take a look and see what happened in Wuhan, because that was interesting, because that was one of the first places that had the it reported the issue, and one of the first to actually re recover and start going back to normal from it. And one of the interesting impacts is there was a massive increase in the number of people that were buying cars. And if you take a look at the stats here, there's about half the amount of people that were uh, taking bus, taking bus now than they were taking before, and there's twice as many people driving cars. And you think, well, you know, why is that? And some of it is because the chance of infection. You know, quite frankly, um, you know, people are worried about getting infected, and you can see this as a driver there with this plastic. I guess maybe it's an Uber driver or something like that, or whatever the equivalent is in Wuhan. But they have a, a big plastic shield in, inside of the car to protect themselves. Um, but, you know, as I say, people just don't feel safe traveling anymore like they, like they did before. Uh, so one of the secondary effects is that people are not getting on transit anymore is now there's a sudden change in the source of revenue. So transit companies aren't going to have the revenue coming in that they, that they had enjoyed before be able to provide a, what we call luxurious transit service if you want to. Um, so if that's going to be start scaling, uh, scaling back um, and that will you know, have a big, a big impact on transportation workers or people that depend on the system. So among some of these things, which is interesting, I was taking a look at Moody's, which is an invest, uh, another angle of this thing, looking at uh, investors and what's been recommended. And they talk about, you know, transportation as being one of the seven most vulnerable disruptions resulting from this virus and categorized as being high exposure. So investors that are, that are involved in these areas for either public or maybe private transit companies are going to be taking a second look. Which is, you know, there's a lot of you know, maybe not so much in Canada, but yet in the U.S., a lot of private transit companies uh, that will be impacted, and maybe looking at this completely different way than government-run organizations, and it really has a big impact on people that are most vulnerable in terms of, you know, people that can't afford a car and have no other choice than using transit, and uh, might be hugely impacted by this. Um, so, you know, the decline you take a look at on transit use and, and really we take a look at this because of, you know, the, the transportation impact that this is going to have in terms of, you know, all of a sudden you have 50% of the people or 50% of more potential congestion on the roads than you had before. What does that look like? Um, and getting back to, you know, public transport is that, you know, why are people not going in there? People are worried about a high number of people in a confined space, limited ventilation, no access to identify potentially sick persons. You know, you really, everybody's got a mask on, who knows who's got, you know, who's sick. Uh, and too many common services to touch, uh, like ticket machines, handrails, doorknobs. Um, and you take a look at any of the videos now, they talk, where you take a look, even people with gloves on, uh, is, it's almost a joke because, you know, people are taking the gloves on, they're taking them off, they're holding a the cell phone, putting the cell phone on their face, and then they're putting their gloves back on. And it, it, it's like you're virtually not, you know, you have no protection and it's, you know, it's, things can spread easily. Uh, one of the data is from the popular trip planning app actually showed that in Canadian communities, it dropped an average of 83% in late March. So it's people either maybe restaurant workers or people in any kind of entertainment business, for instance, or um, you know, business where there's a, a lot of consumers, for instance, have just dropped right off. And that was the biggest, uh, the biggest group that was actually um, involved in using transit. Um, and then worldwide, you take a look at you know, 11 countries, 76%. So that's going to have a massive impact on, on infrastructure. And we take a look at you know, the uh, increased congestion. So if things start to go, and who knows what the crystal ball looks like, but you know, towards what happened in Wuhan, where a lot more people start buying cars, uh, that has a very long impact. And you know, that has impact in terms of getting more CO2 emissions, which means you got health impacts or maybe start decreasing. I mean, right now things are quite clean and good, and you think, wow, the earth is healing. But that's only about a month. You know what happens over the next, you know, five, ten years, for instance, as you know the 
things kind of start going back to a new normal, which means see a lot more cars in the road. And the, what is the impact of that? Of those extra greenhouse gas emissions that people hadn't anticipated. Um, you know, a number of accidents. You know, we had to take a look at our Vision Zero programs that people were kind of you know happy and say we're trying to make improvements on. You know, that's going to be set back 20 years by adding more vehicles in the road. Uh, same thing with transit ridership, set back 20 years and all the work to try and get people out of cars and and uh, and, and into using and using buses. So to improve. Um, uh, improve uh, a commuter experience. You know, this is everything is going to be set back a, a long ways. It's take a long time to recover, probably. So along these along these areas, you're talking about it's, it's a long and difficult road for transit agencies moving forwards. Now, uh, even with you know doing things like we're involved in transit signal priority and trying to help via, and help transit move more quickly, uh, that's a tough job to do when you have more vehicles in the road, and it definitely makes it difficult difficult to do anything. Uh, in terms of improving transit or to make transit companies allow them to be able to work more efficiently. Uh, so it really requires a really longer term vision and investment of programs uh, you know, that are rethought out in terms of how to kind of do this and kind of reboot our society and start from scratch almost and moving things forward again. Um, and, you know, and along those lines, it's, it really emphasized the need for more of a global and unified approach too in terms of how things are handled you know, globally. Uh, access to information is also kind of an area too, which especially for acute for people living with disabilities, um, you know, people are maybe less likely to help each other if you're worried about touching somebody or getting near somebody that may have a virus, uh, especially people that have a, a maybe loss of uh, vision, you know, blind or hearing impaired people, for instance, may have trouble, you know, getting the same information that we, you know, maybe readily get on our on, on our phones or on the internet. And so there's a bigger impact out there too that we have to watch out for the more vulnerable people in society. Um, touch but don't touch, interesting. Uh, being involved in, like they would mention in, in accessible pedestrian signals, and we saw that photo of the woman touching her button with, a, with an elbow uh, is all to, you know, the, the norm. And there's a, a picture here on the left side, you can see where somebody's got a bunch of acute uh, toothpicks stuck in a styrofoam pad for people to touch the elevator. <laughs> You know, we really need to kind of take a look at what the impact is and what that new normal looks like for accessibility and for people, how we interact with people at, at intersections. It may no longer be push buttons, it'll be something else. And it has a bigger impact in, in terms of things like you know, when you put um, uh, intersections and recalls, most cities have put at least their major intersections on pedestrian recall that impacts uh, court traffic coordination, which is not a big issue right now because there's not that many cars in the street, but there will be. There will be a lot of cars in the street at some point. And you know, how long do we put, keep the situation where people don't push buttons uh, and, and keep that alive? Um, so that's, you know, it, it creates a lot of ramifications on here. And also for like, say things like, uh, you don't think about like emergency vehicles. Emergency vehicles, you know, are, are sometimes they, are, they have systems that they can prioritize an intersection to get through more quickly. They get severely impacted when you have pedestrian uh, pedestrian recalls on intersections because it slows down that signal changing to red, which slows down the vehicles able to respond. And you talk about a vehicle having to go through multiple uh, multiple intersections, that may be, you know, the, the the point of life and death for somebody that they're trying to get to to help with a heart attack, for example. So you know, there's massive impacts and repercussions. You know, so really we're kind of looking at what new user interfaces will be going forward so that make things more touchless, so to speak. Um, also public alert systems, you know, getting information to people on the street. Maybe we need a, a better system for, you know, dealing with things like massive viral outbreaks, severe weather, natural disaster, or it may even just for crowd control, just informing people on the street, you know, we're doing something different. Like for example, with the push buttons, you see some people putting up signs that say, you know, the buttons are automated right now, right? Well, that's a lot of pieces of paper and they get torn down easily or the rain will wash them down or whatever, right? And so maybe we need better systems for just informing people on the street when we have a change in the environment that's, that doesn't require a big knee-jerk reaction when something does happen. Uh, so getting to just kind of closing off is, you know, really we're talking about sustainable and healthy future for, for people and, and kind of learning from this is that uh, our takeaway is that, you know, you know is we're, not, we're more vulnerable than we thought we were and we end up having these knee-jerk reactions and this could easily happen again tomorrow and it may happen and it may bounce back a few times as they're talking about with the uh, you know, leading health officials uh, over the next two years. Uh, and it's, so we've got you know our own people ourselves which, you know, and trying to keep ourselves healthy. Also, people that are 
well, I say the most vulnerable is people with disabilities or people with, a, with um, a compromised immune systems or the elderly. Um, you know, what systems are we going to put in place to be able to protect people in general and keep a healthy community going forward so that we're more resilient against things like this happening in the future? You know, I like, other than, like, thank you, Vanica, and I think that was my, my last one. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doug and Dave, and uh, thank you for the compliment at the beginning uh, of your presentation. Um, yeah, these webinars uh, are, have been very valuable. We've added a, a seventh webinar now. We're uh, May 26, that far out. Um, question uh, for both Dave and Doug, I guess, is that, um, so how has the, the pandemic that we're currently experiencing affected uh, Novax, and, and is there a positive to this also for for the company um, from your perspective, if any. I think from I, I think from the point of view that um, that whenever you have this kind of chaos or you have the kind of rapid disruption, you know, we went through to the tariff situation with the U.S. Uh, immediately, you know, thereafter, you know, we get through that, and now we're going through COVID, and both were both were substantial impacts on our business. Um, but with COVID, you don't have the certainty of when or if or, or, or what's going to change. You know, it's not a matter of just changing, you know, your supply chain because nothing is protected. Everybody is, is, is being impacted. So from the point of view of our planning, um, we tend to be at this point in time quite transactional. And we're looking to put, as they say in uh, China, if we can use uh, wisdom from China at this point, um, ibu ibu, step by step. And our approach is basically to watch, learn, and listen. Um, and uh, we're going from there. Uh, from the point of view of operational stuff, um, we have always been sort of very close to the chest in terms of uh, managing cash, managing our operations, ensuring that, you know, like some of the things we've done is talk to our, talk through our supply um, and delivery channels. And there's things that have, that have been awarded, work that's been awarded. Well, some of that has had the, we have the opportunity to move up our material supply within a larger award earlier so that we can start moving cash. And one of the things that uh, we had we had originally had in this slideshow was that, you know, in, in, most, in most situations where you have chaos, like it's cash is king. And if you come out of this, it, once we come out of this situation with COVID, um, you want to be in a position that you're able to react and do it nimbly and see what opportunities are out there. Well, you've got to have credit or you've got to have uh, solvency or financial liquidity to do that. And what I think people are facing right now, particularly in the small in the SMEs, is that um, people are various degrees of preparation for this. So, um, you know, what, it, what, what people are doing, I, I think, has got to be very, very, uh, as I say, transactional. You have to stop take a good look at where you're at and plan for this could go on for from the extreme point of view for the next six months to a year and work on that basis so you know uh, have i given any any brilliant insights into i don't think so no more than what i think other people are doing in their organizations but that gives you an insight as to where we're going as well as of thank course, you as well as of course, some technology to respond to this Thank you very much for your uh, candor, and uh, I'm just going to turn the screen back over to me. Um, at least I hope so, here. Um, and next up is Michael. Uh, just here. Michael is the general manager, Michael McGuire, sorry that is, is the general manager of Stinson Owl Lights ITS division. He has a diverse technology background with experience across many disciplines, including networking, automated control system, wireless communications, and intelligent transportation systems. Michael has been a project manager, account manager, solution architect, and now general manager of the ITS and R&D divisions at Stinson. He services the entire Canadian market and attends all major trade shows in North America, keeping up with the latest technology trends. With a strong focus on business and product development, he is constantly refining, refining and improving Stinson's products offerings. Michael, I am going to make you the presenter. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can share my screen properly. Uh, 
Let me see if I'm presenting. Is that presenting correctly with the full screen? Can see your notes. Okay, and I need to show you the other screen. Not sure why it's showing both screens. Same thing? Yep. Hmm. No, give me one moment, please. It's funny, give me the option to show two separate screens yesterday. Oh, I guess I should have had my notes separately. You should be able to hide your notes at the bottom where it says notes. Yeah, it's just pulling up my secondary screen, not the primary screen. Okay. So, a moment here. Let's see if I can uh, change the way my desktop is showing to not duplicate it. Just kind of delete my external monitor here, and I think that'll make the difference. Give me one moment. I also have your presentation. Do you want to do use it that way? No, it's not working. Okay. Okay. Good. So uh, let me see if this works. Is that okay? Right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Yannicka, and uh, thank you, Matthew and Doug. Those were very interesting presentations, uh, and especially what Doug, you said about uh, push buttons becoming a thing of the past, perhaps, is uh, very interesting, and I hadn't considered the fact that people are going to be very hesitant to push those buttons now. And uh, so today I'm talking about traffic data solutions, and in particular, uh, permanent traffic data collection. So it's going to lend itself well to what Matthew was talking about, because those modeling software uh, systems require a lot of data in order to have good analysis. Let me just see. So to give you a brief overview of Stinson Owlite, uh, I run the ITS division, uh, which is about five years old, but Stinson Owlite itself is a company that's over 55 years old with about 85 employees, whereas the ITS division is growing and has about 11 employees now. We sell systems uh, related to intersection control, uh, data collection, smart work zones, and intelligent warning systems. So today we're going to talk about a few different things. We're first going to talk about the new challenges and opportunities that we're seeing coming out of this COVID-19 emergency. Then we're going to look at how data can be used to uh, adapt to these new challenges, as well as look at the architecture of what a permanent data collection system looks like, as well as some um, specific products that Stinson offers to facilitate this. And then finally, we're going to look at a case study from Region Appeal who's using some of this technology uh, to analyze the impact of COVID-19. So as we look at the new challenges and opportunities, as all the presenters mentioned, this is the new norm and things are changing drastically. And uh, things like driving a vehicle is way down, bike usage is way up, and people are scared to use transit. So managers and agencies are trying to decide, you know, how to, uh, how to adapt to this. And one of the big challenges is, is that if you don't have the data, it's very hard to figure out what your response is going to be to this uh, to this data. Something like, do you want to add temporary bike lanes, or do you want to adjust the level of public transit service in one area or the other? Or perhaps right now is a good time to push through some emergency road work. If you don't have the data, it's very hard to make these decisions. So we're going to look at how data can be used and the value of it in the next slide here. So when we talk about data, what we talk about more than anything about is its value in driving an iterative approach into uh, decision making. So when we what we're looking at here is a very standard iterative chart. So we collect data, we analyze data, we prioritize the issues that we find, then we deploy those solutions, and most importantly, we analyze the impact of those solutions. 
And every time we go through this cycle, we get better at what we're doing. We become more efficient, we do more with less, and we're able to determine what works and what doesn't. And you're not just guessing, you actually have a way to prove your hypotheses and know what is the best approach to a certain problem that you encounter. But of course, again, without the data, we can't go through this approach. So we're gonna take a little bit look at the system architecture that's involved in a permanent data collection system. So what we have here is a, essentially permanent data collection is becoming more and more popular. Traditionally, people would do short-term studies or farm it out to a third party that will do a manual count at an intersection or at a mid block. And we're seeing cities more and more move towards permanent data collection so that they can see what's happening in all conditions, not just a little slice of an eight hour study here or a one week study here or there. And what that looks like is using sensors combined with um, the internet of things and cloud commute computing to provide turnkey solutions, something that's very easy to deploy. We're seeing sensors now that have very low power and support IoT and cellular communications. So now these sensors are very cheap and easy to deploy. You can use solar power and cellular communications to deploy an entire sensor system on a single pole with very low infrastructure costs. So what we're looking at today is I'm gonna show you two sensors from a manufacturer called Houston Radar. And they have one sensor called the Speed Lane Pro, which is focused on larger arterial roads or freeways up to 16 lanes as well as a smaller sensor designed for smaller roadways called, called the Armadillo Tracker. This will um, collect the, the same data sets, volume, speed, and classification, but it's focused on only up to four lanes. And it, as you can see in this diagram here, the architecture is a bunch of sensors deployed across a wide area at different roadways throughout your city connected through a cellular network. It could also be on your fiber, but we're seeing a big jump in cellular, driving all the data back to a central cloud system, which then stores the data forever and has it sitting there waiting for a user to use a browser-based interface to log on and access or download the data anytime they want. So as I mentioned, there's two sensors I'm focusing on today. I mentioned bike lanes earlier. So these two sensors are focused on vehicle detectors, but we do have uh, data collection solutions for uh, all modes of transportation, whether it be uh, cyclists, pedestrians, or even e-scooters. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the Speed Lane Pro. This is a sensor that's focused on uh, large arterial roads. It uh, is FMCW radar and uh, it's a very high quality or high accuracy data uh, sensor. I wish I had my notes here, but this has been proven recently to be the highest accuracy sensor on the market. And I'm a little biased to say that, but Texas DOT did a study last year where they compared the Speedlane Pro with the Wavetronic Smart Sensor HD and to a ground truth. And it was a very uh, shocking study that was very heavily uh, favored towards the Speedlane Pro. And this is a public study, so I'd be happy to share the results, and they're also on my LinkedIn page. So this is a sensor that on the left-hand side, this is a city of Brampton deployment. It can be deployed with a small solar panel system with a built-in cell modem, and can just begin collecting data. It takes about two to three hours to install at the most, and you're off to the races. On the right-hand side is kind of like the little brother to the speed lane. It's called the Armadillo Tracker. So this will collect data in up to four lanes, it collects the same data sets, speed, volume, and classification. And it's just a little less accurate on the data because it's meant to be portable and moved around and it uses Doppler technology instead of FMCW, you only get about 90 to 97% accuracy compared to the speed lane, which is closer to 98 or 99. Now, I'm focused on permanent data collection solutions today, but I do want to mention that the Armadillo Tracker does offer a battery only option. And that is traditionally how the sensor has been used. Because of that, it's been very focused on a quick and easy deployment, so you can install it in under 10 minutes. And when it's used in that way, it's very comparable to previous older technologies like road tubes that are used to collect data, except this is much easier to deploy and safer because you don't have to go onto the road to actually staple down those tubes. And most importantly, you can use it in the winter. So as far as software, there's three options. The cloud software, Tetrion, which can either be hosted by Houston Radar or by a client themselves. 
Stats Analyzer, which is the PC-based software. And there's also an Android app, which allows you to download historical data as well as view live video and traffic data, which is extremely helpful when you're setting up and aiming these devices. Now we're gonna take a little look at a case study from Region Appeal. They were one of the early adopters of this technology and very innovative in the Ontario marketplace. As early as 2017, they began deploying these sensors and they started with 10 test sites to verify the principle and make sure that they were happy with the results. And it's been a great success. They've actually been adding about 10 installations every single year ever since. Now, the reason they chose to go with a permanent count station is because deploying road tubes were very resource intensive. There was reoccurring costs. They were dangerous to deploy because employees had to go out onto the road itself. They're also limited data because you typically only get a one day study or a couple day study. And it's also most importantly not possible in the winter. So the sensor has been deployed for a couple of years now and they've actually been used for a number of analysis to see the pattern changes throughout the region. They're up to 32 sensors now and they're scattered across the entire region. And related to this uh, presentation, they've used the sensors on aggregate to do a comparison between 2019 and 2020, uh, 2020 data to see what impact uh, COVID-19 has had. And they've been nice enough to share that data with me. So I'm just gonna jump over to that now. So this is a look at, uh, as I mentioned, 2019 comparing to 2020 and, and how have those patterns changed as the uh, crisis began. So in the early parts of the year, they saw a fairly good growth of 10 to 15% consistently throughout the year. And then as soon as the emergency started, just after the dip or just before the dip, is um, when Region Appeal declared an emergency. And now you can see they've had as much as a 60% decrease in the number of vehicles traveling through the region. And as far as what they can do with this data now, there's a lot of remedial actions that uh, cities are trying to do and things like temporary bike lanes, like I mentioned. And, and unless you have the data like this, it's very difficult to determine uh, where you can do this, what is the impact likely gonna be if you do this, and when is congestion building back up such that you might wanna change your strategies as things go forward. And Region Appeal was the first, but I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, City of Brampton and the MTO are now deploying systems just like this. And they all are focused on that same concept of a sensor deployed off the grid with a solar system, cellular communications, and cloud hosting by Houston Radar. So it really is a turnkey solution. They just have the data sitting there, always at their fingertips, and they just log on and grab it as they need. So that's it for me today. Um, thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, um, Michael. Um, I have a question um, uh, for you. How has um, the current crisis and pandemic um, affect um, your work? Um, is it, there more work to do? It seems that we're all more busy than before. And, and um, if you can maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually been quite busy for us here. We have a number of ongoing projects, so we haven't been impacted. It might show up down the road a little bit more. But it's been very positive for the company. I've been pushing for quite a while to move towards a more uh, digital strategy, work from home and a focus on webinars just like this. And so it's been really nice because this pushes us to innovate and adopt these systems much more quickly than might have been traditionally possible. So we're, we're beginning webinar series, we're focusing more efforts on e-marketing. And so it really pushes us in that direction. And I believe uh, most companies are going to start seeing that trend. So we're taking the time now to innovate and try to develop the resources we need so that when things start to return to normal, we're able to hit the ground running. So it's been very good for us. Thank you. There's a question uh, by Mara Bullock, who was wondering if those two sensors also collect cyclist and pedestrian data. They, they do not. No, because they're radar based, it's very difficult to get a cross section significant enough on a bicycle and uh, on a pedestrian to do that. But we do have alternative sensors like the Myovision traffic link that can collect multimodal data. And that's what we typically deploy for those type of uh, studies that we're trying to do. We do also have a LIDAR sensor that's coming out shortly, but that's not formally announced. But if you do have an interest to collect that kind of data, I'd be happy to uh, discuss it with you. Thank you. 
Um, so at this point, there is no uh, further questions. So I am going to um, bring the screen back to me. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, there we go. And um, sorry that we are running uh, late. Um, I do apologize for that. We had a little bit of a later start. Um, but I do want to thank um, all three presenters. And the, this webinar is being recorded. And the recording will be available um, on the ITS Canada website uh, later on this afternoon or first thing tomorrow morning. Um, our next webinar in this series will happen um, May 5th which is uh, already next week. Um, so don't forget to sign up for that. Um, thank you for everybody who attended today's webinar. Um, continue to stay safe, continue to stay connected, and um, I thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Thanks a lot, Yannicka. Thank you, bye-bye. We weren't on anyway, I couldn't hear us.